Universal Laws. Before we get into either of the laws that will be used here, there's one thing you must find a way to believe before you can believe in anything else, in your own power or in your own ability to create your destiny. Before you can believe that you can build a positive world for yourself and those whose lives you touch, you have to believe to the point that you know whatever you've survived can help you build a better future. There are some philosophers who will tell you that you chose this life and the things that you were going to suffer before you were born into it. You'll hear it whether you believe it is a matter of your personal choice. What I believe doesn't matter. What anyone else believes about this subject is irrelevant. What matters and the only opinion that counts here is yours. If you choose to believe this or disbelieve this concept, it doesn't make you better or worse, stronger or weaker. It doesn't make you more or less evolved. It's just an idea. Use it or don't, depending on whether or not it fits into who you are on your way to becoming. Once you know this and believe this fact, you'll have excavated much of your guilt and self-recrimination and can begin to lay the foundation of a positive future. What are the universal laws? The rules that govern the interaction of energies in the universe. We're going to utilize two of the most important ones in this book. The Law of Self-Responsibility In childhood, a great many of the things we endure are brought to us by various authority figures. Parents, family, friends, peers. These events are almost never the fault of the child. Our responsibility for the events in our lives begins in the early years of adolescence and ends when we're six feet under. The Law of Self-Responsibility comes into effect as soon as you are able to know better and holds true with even more certainty once you have become what society considers a legal adult. At that point, the consequences of your actions are your responsibility. It's listed as the fourth tier up on the energetic pyramid because it's something many of us struggle with on a daily basis. To get to the point where it becomes your nature will take a lot of work and probably facing up to a lot of things you might not want or be ready to see. Like all the personal stages, they're all points to progress, just like we are all works in progress. This law is actually the most fundamental in that it helps the individual build their own supply of internal power. It's that internal power that helps provide strength when you begin using the first part of tip number one, which is own your past. It also helps give the individual strength when it comes time to forgive past transgressions that others have made on you. It's the first step to honestly claiming or creating the life that's right for you. Each of us has to be able to acknowledge our actions and how they affect those around us. This consists of responsibility for all the intentional acts for either good or bad that we each have done. Power doesn't come from ignoring these things. It comes from acknowledging our faults to ourselves if no one else. And, here's another key point, acting intentionally to do better in the future. A right life isn't about being perfect. My grandma used to say the only perfect people are dead people. A right life is about doing your best to make the most positive choices you can when you are presented with the option to make them. Honoring this law is what lets you look yourself in the eye and accept that from this moment forward, you will move into your future with integrity and sincerity. Once you make that choice, you'll find that so many others will come just a little more easily. You have the power. What is power, you might ask? Power is the capacity to perform effectively. In physics, it's the ability to do work. There are those who wield power out there in the world, those who can literally command the life or death of another human being. But the greatest power a person can have is power over their self. Think about this. What would you as a person think about someone who was able to rise above those who held power over others? Are they not more powerful than those who keep others in line, either physically, socially, economically, or politically by force or fear? I say they are, and I'm not the only one. I do say, however, that the power that I am talking about is inside you. It's inside each individual to claim, to use, or abuse as they see fit. The sword cares nothing for he who forged it. Its cleave is as indiscriminate to its smith as it is to the enemy against whom it is wielded. I'm here, this book is here, to explain why you should choose to use that power rather than abuse it. 
Gratitude. Grateful for what I have, but always willing to have more. Anonymous. True gratitude is more than just being able to acknowledge the good things you have. Far too many people have spent far too much time simply listing all the wonderful things they have in an effort to find richness in their lives by learning the art of gratitude. True gratitude comes from taking the time to contemplate how you have attained those things that you have, as well as measuring what you've done to get them against the ethics of the person you want to be. To some, gratitude is thanking God for the food on their plate, even though it was essentially their mother or father who went to work and earned money to purchase that food then brought it home so it could be cooked and shared. They don't think about the people who make pennies a day doing back-breaking work tossing melons down the line, constantly in fear of losing their job, and then subsequently having to wonder where their family will get their food. They don't think about people who run the farms that are frequently under so much pressure to produce bigger, sweeter, juicier foods faster, and at lower cost, so that the corporations who decide whether or not to buy their foods or fruits can make bigger profits while cutting the share that the actual farmer and his family make. To some, gratitude is finding a quarter on the ground that will enable them to take a bus home on a sub-zero night so that they don't have to walk a dozen blocks in the bone-chilling cold and risk not being able to go to work the next day because they caught a chill. To some, gratitude is for the people who helped a terrified parent find a missing child safe and sound at a friend's house. Sometimes it's being grateful that there's a warm blanket over you on a cold night, Sometimes it's the passerby who hands off a bus transfer that has a couple rides left on it. Sometimes it's the person who drops a few coins or even some paper money into an open guitar case on the street where a modern-day minstrel is performing. Sometimes it's something as basic as the ability to take a breath without feeling like you're drowning. The point is to look at these things you have. A roof over your head that doesn't leak, at least not all the time. Food in your pantry, even if it's just rice and beans. Close on your children. Think about where these things came from. Not just your hard work that put them there, but what qualities you have that enabled you to achieve at least this much and keep you striving to achieve even more. And more importantly, it's to look at all the people around you, the store owners, the construction workers, the employer, the co-workers, the spouses, the in-laws, the older kids, the clients who make your life possible. You have been programmed. We have all been programmed by the world and people around us. We are a product of a program that was a copy of a copy of a copy back into perpetuity of a copy of a copy of a program. All along the way, there have been updates, usually controlled by some external, i.e. political, social, economic, religious force, But not a single one of us has written a completely new and personal program in eons. Fact is, most of us didn't even know we had that option. Well, we do. The first step in making any change is the realization that change is possible. If you dare to embrace the idea that personal change is possible, you will find yourself blocked, sabotaged, and discouraged at almost every turn. Your desire to rewrite your own programming must be stronger than any argument against it. Even when the most powerful of those arguments comes from within the program you're already running. Before we go any further, there are at least three things you must know in order to make the best possible decision about the person you will become. They are homeostasis, knowns, and unknowns. The first thing you must understand is the idea of homeostasis. This is typically a term used in medicine. It's literally maintaining your body's status quo, keeping your respiration at a comfortable rate, your heartbeat at a steady pace, your body temperature at a safe constant. But there is both a subconscious and a conscious homeostasis as well. 88% of our daily lives are moved through without conscious thought. We get up, shower, make coffee, eat breakfast, dress, and go to work. We perform our job, return home, eat dinner, watch TV, check email, go to bed, all largely on autopilot, neither fully aware or conscious of what we're doing or sometimes even why. Subconscious homeostasis is a product of those automatic behaviors we do every day. For example, you're on your way home when your best friend calls or texts saying, happy hour, meet us. At that point, you're faced with a conscious decision that likely brings you back to the moment. 
weighing the joy and stress relief of happy hour with friends versus the early night sleep that you are going to get in order to feel more refreshed for that big meeting or presentation tomorrow. It's very likely that if you have a history of joining your friends for happy hour, that you will do it again. The choice is not even a choice. What you will likely experience is a subconscious homeostatic drive to go join your friends. You know you will overindulge. You won't sleep well, and you'll feel like crap tomorrow as you move through your presentation or meeting, just like you've done an untold number of times before. You do this because the consequences of happy hour on the eve of a big presentation or weekly meeting are what's considered in your life known. In all likelihood, it's been so long since you've actually managed to get home and go to bed early that you're no longer sure if you can function optimally without the ritual of a prior night's happy hour. You tell yourself that if you went home and got to bed early that you'd most likely just toss and turn wondering how the presentation or meeting will go. Then in fact you'll lose sleep because you didn't take the necessary step of having one or two too many cocktails that ensures you're out like a light as soon as your head hits the pillow. You have now not only enabled your own subconscious homeostatic conditioning but reinforced it as well by consciously justifying a negative effect known. Instead of making a conscious choice to face what has become an unknown in the form of an early night of solid, chemical-free rest. Let's take this a step further and imagine that the meeting or presentation is not just another weekly hoop to jump through, but this time a promotion hangs in the balance. That promotion means an extra $10,000 a year, pushing you from $40,000 to $50,000 a year, which means you can afford to put that addition on the house which will increase its resale value by at least ten to 15000 and you can afford to lease that new car, too. That extra 10000 a year puts you into a whole new tax bracket and headed toward financial security your parents never dreamed of. It's more money than you ever thought possible for you to make. So you make your fuzzy-headed presentation, or you miss a few key points in the meeting, and you blame it on the hangover fogging your mind. Across the table, a junior staffer brings up solutions to your missed points and gets the raise and promotion you've been angling for since you started in the mailroom. It's not fair, but it is your program. This isn't an example of flawed human behavior. This is an example of your programming headed toward financial security your parents never dreamed of. It's more money than you ever thought possible for you to make. Working perfectly. So let's run a diagnostic on your program. You're 45 years old. You were an elementary school age child in the 1970s. You remember when candy bars were 25 cents and pretzel sticks were two cents at the local store. You remember penny candy. And you know that you were what was called upper middle class because your dad made good money. Probably about $18,000 a year. Perhaps you recall thinking or hearing someone say, or more likely you don't recall it, that making 40000 a year would mean you were rich and easily, firmly upper class. And maybe when it came to those mysterious millionaires, you might have been told something like, we're not that kind of people, or don't get too big for your britches, or that kind of money changes people. Each of the above statements carrying a negative connotation that people with too much wealth were not to be trusted or thought that they were better than the little people or average folk. All of the above sentiments came from an external source, probably a parent or other role model. It became a program, the inference being that you could make up to 40000 a year and still be considered normal and therefore acceptable. So through this program, the number 40,000 slid through what we call a filter in your mind and into your subconscious mind. It became your wealth set point. Reaching that set point turned on homeostasis, and that point, that number, is where your subconscious mind will do everything it can to keep you, including sabotaging every effort to surpass that set point by keeping your subconscious focused on the result of behaviors whose outcomes are known even if they are deleterious to your eventual prosperity. The subconscious mind doesn't care or know about the cost of living increases. It doesn't care or know about inflation. It doesn't care or know about the value of a dollar. It only knows it must keep you at your set point. When the day comes that the average minimum wage is equal to 40000 a year, your subconscious won't care. 
You may barely be able to afford a 750 square foot one bedroom apartment, but no matter what you do, you won't be able to break out of that 40,000 per year income bracket unless your program gets rewritten. Now let's take a look at the junior staffers program. JS was raised in an upper class setting, taught investing during the Clinton years, where his modest savings spiraled into a high five figure nest egg for him to use after graduating college. JS's father was a self-made man who escaped a hard-working but impoverished ghetto with a ravenous appetite for education and an innate knowledge that there had to be more. Nothing was ever enough. There was always more to be had, more wealth, more security, more knowledge, more everything. As a result, when JS was born, his father made sure to drill into him that no matter what the external forces were at play, there was no limit to what he could achieve. JS's degree landed him a position as an aide to a senior staffer who supported, nurtured, and cultivated his creativity and economic prowess. JS came to the table with his first financial set point being to land a $50,000 per year job by the time he was 28. He's currently 27 and he just landed that job. His next set point is to make six figures by the time he's 35. After that, he will have the investments, capital, and contacts to build his own company. He wants to retire by 60 with an eight-figure annual income. The odds are he will achieve a huge amount of the success he has been programmed to, if not all of it. Very rarely does the difference between success and struggle come down to the intellectual prowess of an individual. It is, in fact, our programming to a large degree that even determines our learning power, the limits of our intellect. Knowns, whether they are good or bad for us, we will choose them at every possible instance, so long as we are acting without conscious direction. And sometimes even when we think we are, we still choose a negative effect known over an unknown. Why does a smoker continue to smoke even when they know it's not good for them? Because they know what to expect when they light a cigarette. They know the first cough will come right after the first drag. They know the back of their throat will sear with chemical fire burning through the mucous membrane, leaving the tissue weakened and stressed, and eventually subject to the cancer that will set up shop in his or her throat. Unknowns. Knowing is only half of the problem. The other half of the problem is the fact that what will happen to the smoker when they quit is an unknown. They don't know how they will feel in the morning. They don't know what they will do while they have the first cup of coffee. They don't know how it's going to feel being able to run up and down the stairs without being winded. They don't know what they're going to do with the money they're not putting towards cigarettes. Fear of unknowns drives the subconscious homeostatic program even when the results of a known behavior are detrimental to the being of an organism as a whole. The self-sabotaging exec who can't break past 40000 per year doesn't know what it's like to be a millionaire and subconsciously doesn't want to know. 40,000 a year is comfortable. The status, the purchasing power, it's all known. What will happen if they suddenly make 50,000 a year is unknown. The program that anyone who makes more than 40,000 a year is too big for their britches or that kind of people, coupled with an internalized negative connotation keeps the individual's wealth set point at 40,000 per year. All the information contained here is simply meant to provide an alternative view and a few coping strategies that may help others find their way to their own life of wellness, satisfaction, and fulfillment that all sentient beings are entitled to. My life, like yours, is a work in progress. Like all people, I too experience good times and bad times. One of the most important keys to building a life of satisfaction and fulfillment is to keep the bad times reduced to the barest possible minimum while increasing the duration of the good times to their maximum potential. Add this to the number of things you have in your life that bring you joy, and what you have, in the language of power, is a multi-phase source for fulfillment. That source is your mindset. Is it a growth mindset, or is it a fixed mindset? Look up Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, and Fixed Mindset versus Growth Mindset on YouTube. It all starts with you. Rather than filling these pages with the same old hashed and rehashed bits, let's get them out in the open now so that you're able to decide just how ready you are to move forward. 
There is no right and no wrong. There is no, you must do this now. All these steps are yours to take or leave at the convenience of your life. The most important part is that with this information, you're armed for a life you're worthy of at whatever time you choose to begin. Following is a list of physical equipment you will need to begin your journey. Calendar and a pen. The following is a list of emotional equipment you will need to begin your journey. Belief that you are worthy of a fulfilling and satisfying life. Desire to build that life. Expectation that you can do anything you set your mind to. Determination to stand against those who would sabotage your efforts, including you, no matter what ghosts, insecurities, and past failures they may dredge up and throw into your face. The most important thing to know about making changes from who you were programmed by others to be to the you who's going to write their own new life program is permission. That permission can only come from one source, you. I'm here to open your eyes to your own potential. It's a gift that was given me by my mother and one I hope to pass forward. As we did when we were children, let's start with the ABCs and one, two, threes. These are the building blocks to your successful recovery of who you are meant to be. A, acknowledge, and most importantly, accept that you are worthy of self-direction and fulfillment. This means you'll often come face to face with the indoctrination others have used to stifle, control, and manipulate you all your life. It's at this point that you'll need to decide whether or not you're going to keep the ideals, ideas, and programming of others used to make you into who they wanted you to be, or if you're going to rewrite your own program to be who you want to be. You will also need to decide, as you inspect the code of your programming, what you find worth keeping and what needs to be rewritten. Only you can do this. Only you have the right to do this. B. Budget. Budget your resources, the computer, family, friends. Budget your money, and most importantly, budget your time. Set aside whatever time you need each week to pursue the person you feel you are meant to be. And C, create a plan. Use a notebook, calendar, calculator. Get a list of those who have succeeded before you together. Set a time frame, like by next week, I'll have five letters of introduction ready to go to my potential mentors. In one year, I'll be an apprentice. In two years, I'll be in X position. Ten years after that, I'll have XXX resources, income, position. Any self-help guru will tell you that writing down your goals dramatically increases your chances of success. Why, you might ask? Simple. You're training your subconscious to accept changes to its programming. Writing is an idiomotor activity. Once we've learned the mechanics of writing and have developed our handwriting style, the actual use of cursive becomes subconscious. We can address our own subconscious mind by writing out our goals and seeing them in our own writing. By doing this, we open the filter of our mind to the possibilities of achieving these goals, slowly turning them from unknowns to knowns, effectively reprogramming ourselves to a new level of personal achievement in any endeavor. The Kappas Mental Bank System is one of the most consistently successful models of this kind of personal reprogramming. When you look at the happenings in the world around you, ask yourself why they don't teach children cursive anymore. Could it be that by utilizing a writing system that helps grow the brain and its concurrent neural pathways, we could be raising smarter children? Those more capable of critical thinking? Those more capable of questioning the status quo? Could it be that there are those who hold the reins to our society that would want to make sure that the children who are coming up in this world don't have the mental capacity to question them? Or to question why things are done the way they are? Cursive is a tool that stimulates thinking. If your child's school won't teach it, perhaps you might think about teaching your child yourself. Now for the one, two, threes. One, research whatever it is necessary to achieve your goals. Is it more education? Is it more money? Is it more time? How much will you need to devote? How long will it take? What are reasonable expectations given what will be required? Two, secure your mentor. Your mentor should be someone who has achieved what you aspire to have or be. Most people, once they have achieved their own measure of success, are very happy to help the next generation do the same. Being able to pay our achievements forward helps assure us that our own efforts will not be forgotten even if one day our name is. Three, take the first step. 
After all the research and legwork you've done, you now know what to do. All you have to do is actually do it. So do it. Take the first step of your journey. What we'll find in subsequent chapters are the 10 simple steps that can help you stay on your task as you rewrite your program and become the person you know you were always meant to be.